Our next session is based on obstetric emergency, maternal collapse, caught unaware. We will now have the pleasure of calling our next set of chairpersons to the dais. Can we have Dr. Shalini Rajaram, Dr. Sunita Mittal and Dr. Neera Agarwal on the stage. As they are taking the place, I have the absolute honor of uh, saying a few words about our esteemed chairpersons. Dr. Sunita Mittal, a well-known, renowned name in obstetrics and gynae with more than 42 years of experience, pioneer in emergency contraceptive research and protocol, and issuing guidelines for medical abortions in India, a speaker and visionary on many obstetrics and gynae issues. Dr. Mittal is currently director and HOD at Fortis Memorial Research Institute, Gurgaon. May we have you on the stage, ma'am. Dr. Shalini Rajaram. Hi, ma'am. Chairperson AOGD Oncology Society. Dr. Rajaram is an ACE academician and scholar with scores of researches behind her. Her interest in gynae oncology is well known. She has been part of many gynae forums and guiding light to scores of students in the science of ops and gynae. Dr. Neera Agrawal. Hi, you were the last minute inclusion. Hello, madam. Uh, Dr. Neera Agrawal is an accomplished obstetrician and gynecologist. She is former HOD Guru Teg Bahadur Hospital and presently she is heading Ops and Gynae at Max Perpetent. Welcome aboard, madam. May we now have the pleasure of announcing our next speaker, Dr. Manju Puri. Can we have you on the stage, ma'am? Can we call upon Dr. Ila Gupta and Dr. Raj Bukharia? to please be on the stage and welcome our esteemed speaker with a floral bouquet. Welcome Dr. Puri, can you have, uh, can you take the stage? Can I request Dr. Sunita Mittal to please introduce the concept of this subject? First, of course, I would like to compliment Dr. Sharda Jain, Dr. Urmil Sharma for organizing all this activity so painstakingly and looking after all the details, getting thinner and thinner. But remember, we have been talking of all the advances since the afternoon began. We heard about all the advances in ART, robotic surgeries, endoscopic surgeries and what not. But still, still as obstetricians and gynecologists, we will still encounter where a mother would suddenly collapse. And same time, your blood pressure will go down and your pulse rate will go up and you really could not know what has suddenly happened. There was nothing wrong with that. I'm not talking of those high-risk pregnancies where you are anticipating problem. You have a team with you to look after those high risk, but it may suddenly happen when you may be just alone. So I'm sure it's a very timely topic and younger generation may go to all those advanced technologies in future, but at the moment they should be able to manage such a woman who suddenly collapses. So I think the timing and the topic is very, very timely. It will still remain relevant till we have an artificial womb making all the babies and women's role finishes in this world. Maybe that will be another blessing for women if they don't have to carry pregnancies and everybody chooses their babies, puts them in that artificial womb and picks up what they want to do. That is, I think, still far ahead, may not be in our lifetime, so maybe later. But let's hear Manjupuri talking about our day-to-day -day practice problems which may we may encounter any time. I think at the outset I must thank Dr. Sharda Jain for this spectacular and grand event of honoring teachers. It was really superb and wonderful. I've never seen anything like this in 30 years of my teaching experience. Thank you so much. And it's again a privilege to chair the session of uh, Dr. Manju Puri and I'm honored to read her citation. Uh, Dr. Manju Puri, all of us know, is an academician and a teacher par excellence. She's well acclaimed for her wealth of knowledge, ex experience and definitely her oratory skills. She's presently the, pre uh, po presently the Director Professor at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Lady Harding Medical College and Sucheta Hospital, Kriplani Hospital, where she has been a faculty since 1992. She's a member of the National Academy of Medical Sciences, a fellow of the Indian College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and an associate member of RCOG. 
She is a visionary and a great mentor, having steered several committees as a leader. At present, Vice President, National Association of Reproductive and Child Health, uh, Narchi Delhi, Editor Delhi, Gynecologist Endoscopist Societies, uh, Endoscopist Society, and National Facilitator of Adolescent Health. Dr. Manju Puri is well decorated with awards and the recipient of CS Dawn Prize and the uh, CL Chaveri Prize and also awarded the Suman Kher Oration. She's authored several books. She has chapters in several books and over 100 publications in peer-reviewed international and national journals and is involved in important research projects. So it is indeed an honor to have her as an invitational speaker for her talk on caught unawares, maternal collapse, something that obstetricians are always geared to face day in and day out. We are always in that state of alert on Teacher's Day by the Delhi Gynecology uh, Forum. We wish her success and good fortune for all her future endeavors. Dr. Manju Puri, please. A very good evening to all of you and my thanks uh, to Dr. Sharda Jain and the D Delhi Gynecologist Forum team to have actually uh, made me a part of this important event uh, which is indeed uh, something which is different from what we've had in the past. So after uh, a lovely, lovely talk by Dr. Uh, R.K. Sharma which was at that level I bring you to the ground realities and I'll be talking on maternal collapse uh, caught unawares. I'll take you through two case studies and kind of bring things uh, back to us and understand as to how can we gear ourselves up to handle this difficult situation. This is a 25 years old primary presented with term pregnancy with preterm rupture of membranes. She had a poor Bishop score, underwent cervical ripening followed by oxytocin infusion had LSCS for fetal distress under spinal block, delivered a healthy baby boy, 2.8 kg. All was okay till this time, and we all go through this over and over again every day. But this patient had sudden cardiac arrest during placental extraction. After a seizure-like episode, she was resuscitated and intubated. She was put on ventilator, plasma 16 cryoprecipitates, the packs were removed after two days. The patient remained on ventilator for 10 days and was discharged after seven day, 17 days. Well, this was amniotic fluid embolism. Now, because this patient was in a corporate hospital, uh, everything was available, the team was available, the facilities were available, she could be resuscitated immediately, and things fell in place. But had it been a small obstetric setup, which a large number of people would have, uh, and we do conduct deliveries. This event can happen there also. So I am not sure if the result would have been the same. Now, amniotic fluid embolism is a rare but severe complication of pregnancy. The incidence ranges anything between 1.2 to 12.5 per 1 lakh births. We do not, these are UK figures, uh, figures from the developed countries. We do not have figures because we do not have maternal audit, uh, universal maternal audit, and we do not have postmortems. So we don't know what the figures are. We do have unexplained deaths happening. If you talk to any obstetrician, they've had one or two such events happening in their lives, which they would remember. The case fatality rate is 11 to 43 percent, which has come down. Uh, from 80% initially, so it is not that these patients cannot be saved, but how many would have neurological deficit is yet to be evaluated. This condition is characterized by sudden, unexplained sudden cardiovascular collapse, respiratory distress and coagulopathy, and the incidence appears to be on the rise. Now this is an uh, interesting article which has been published in British Journal of Hobbs and Gynae by Fitzpatrick et al which was a review of 120 cases of amniotic fluid embolism reported over 12, 10 years in UK. And what was important was that it was significantly associated. Everything was well. The patient was eating well. She was, uh, you know, the, she was moving. Everything was fine when she developed sudden episode of breathlessness after 14 hours. She was propped up, started on oxygen, given emergency care. She collapsed within 10 minutes. She was intubated had cardiorespiratory arrest, she could not be revived. Uh, we did a post-mortem on this patient, and the patient had massive pulmonary embolism uh, with deep vein thrombosis, which was not manifest. She didn't have any pedal edema or anything. And this was a case of pulmonary embolism. Now, embolism as a cause of maternal mortality. We often, uh, like as students and even as, you know, my initial years, 
somehow it just didn't hit that embolism would be there. We always thought that our population is not predisposed to embolism because there are less of thrombophilias in our uh, population, it is Caucasian population. It is a problem of them. Well, it is a problem of developed countries, but we are now shifting from developing to developed countries, so we better gear ourselves up to this particular problem. Now, this is the data from UK. They have a proper confidential inquiry into all maternal deaths, and it shows thrombosis and thrombobolism as the top killer, direct cause of maternal death followed by antepartum hemorrhage and then amniotic fluid embolism. So meaning thereby uh, these causes of non-hemorrhagic collapse. Hemorrhagic collapse, we all are uh, tuned. Uh, we are kind of, we have it at a spinal level. We can handle all hemorrhagic collapses. But non-hemorrhagic uh, collapse is something which we really need to gear up. Well, how relevant is it in India? This is a study which has been published from a uh, tertiary level center in Andhra Pradesh. It is a five-year cross-sectional hospital-based study which gives a maternal mortality ratio of uh, 96.37. Hemorrhage was the leading cause, but see, it is thromboembolism which was closely following the hemorrhage, meaning thereby it is not that our population is protected against thromboembolism. It is there and we need to know how to handle it. The patient profile is changing, the obstetric practices are changing. We have older women who are uh, who older pregnant women, heavier women, smokers, more cesareans, more previous cesareans, IVF pregnancies, multiple pregnancies, medical disorders, you name it, all the high risk factors are there. And hence, our sensitization to handling patients with amniotic fluid embolism and thromboembolism is absolutely essential and is the need of our. Now, amniotic fluid, emb amniotic fluid embolism has a high index of suspicion and if diagnosed early, we need to have a high index of suspicion and if diagnosed early, we can do something for the patient. And in thromboembolism, we have a very good intervention of use of thromboprophylaxis, which I feel is very inadequately used in our practice, which needs to be actually uh, stepped up. Now, about amniotic fluid embolism, we know it is unpredictable and it is unpreventable. The only thing we can do is to reduce the high risk factors, but we are not too sure as to in which patient we can have this kind of a thing happening. And we should always maintain a high degree of suspicion. It usually would present as a collapse during labor or delivery on or within 30 minutes uh, of delivery, but this 30 minutes period is not definite. Some people, uh, we have reported uh, uh, cases of amniotic fluid embolism even up till 48 hours after delivery. And it happens, it presents as unexplained acute onset of hypotension, respiratory distress, uh, dyspnea, and falling saturation. The patient becomes hypoxic. And the 80%, more than 80% of the women would have uh, intravascular, uh, you know, DIC. Uh, it might manifest only as a little ooze from the episode B site or from the cesarean site, or a patient where uh, she, you are monitoring and she has some fresh bleeding per vaginum. So that patient might be heading on for amniotic fluid embolism. It is a coagulopathy as which she is manifesting as. She might manifest as coma or seizures or even start a big, massive cardiorespiratory arrest. It is a diagnosis of exclusion. We need to exclude all, exclude all other possibilities. It is absolutely essential that whenever any uh, such event happens, please take a blood sample for coagulation profile and a blood uh, ABG sample. Because if you document metabolic acidosis and coagulopathy, uh, it would favor the diagnosis of amniotic fluid embolism. Now, a word about this important intervention, which has uh, shown to be very effective in developed countries in uh, reducing mortalities related to uh, thromboembolism. Uh, it is thromboprophylaxis. We need to do a risk assessment of our patients uh, in early pregnancy. Secondly, subsequently, if they get admitted for any indication to the hospital, they should be redone. And then in the intrapartum or immediate postpartum period to identify patients who should be put on thromboprophylaxis. Well, this is a, a very uh, interesting chart which I picked up from the Green Drop Guidelines RCOG 2015. Now, what you need to look here is that on this side you have uh, you know, the categorization, if you find a patient who is high risk for thromboembolism, she has to be started on antenatal prophylactic low molecular weight heparin. If she is found to be intermediate risk, you need to consider antenatal prophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin until unless there is a contraindication. 
in the yellow component we have this box here which gives you lots of indications uh, lots of conditions if she has four or more such risk factors uh, she needs to be started from antenatal prophylaxis right from the first trimester onwards. If she has three risk factors, we need to start prophylaxis from 28 weeks of gestation. Here also we have high risk category which needs to be given prophylaxis for six weeks postnatal. And then we have intermediate risk where we need to give it only for 10 days postnatal. And then we have lower risk where no, only early mobilization and avoidance of dehydration is what is required. Now, if we look here at the high risk category, we have patients who have previous history of VT or all those who have had antenatal prophylaxis, they need to be given postnatal. All emergency cesareans, even any emergency cesarean needs to be given for 10 days at least. And same is true about BMI more than 40. And look at these factors. Any of our patients would have two or more risk factors. So all of them need to be given antenatal prophylaxis for 10 days. Now sudden maternal collapse, what is expected? What should be the initial response? Do not panic. It's easier said than done. Well, anyone, it's natural to panic, especially when you know you are not equipped. If you are equipped, you may be confident, but otherwise anyone would panic. But the dictum is don't panic, call for help. Help means you must have some predefined if help is available in-house, call them, but in case the help is not available in-house, you must have the phone numbers, you must have the rescue teams already identified, obstetric and medical rescue teams. And this is where the DGF can go forwards and help the smaller units and help constitute rescue teams so that they can be called and they help people in distress. And then call for action. We must start the initial resuscitation. The management has to be multidisciplinary. The principles of manage would, management would be as for all. Airway protection, we have to maintain breathing and we have to maintain circulation. IV lines have to set up. I need not go into these details. It is important that in every hospital, if it is a small setup or it is a big setup, everyone should undergo a BLS training. And that should be refreshed. It is not that once you have taken BLS training, not put to use. It goes waste. So there has to be a, a regular refreshment of BLS uh, training so that you can do the basic resuscitation whenever in distress. Maintenance of circulation and oxygen is required so that PaO2 of more than equal to 60 millimeter is maintained. Oxygen saturation is maintained above 80 percent. Mean arterial pressure should be maintained above 65 millimeter of mercury and patient should have a urine output of 25 ml per hour. Now the rescue teams have extremely, extremely important uh, role to play. Their numbers should be displayed so that you just, you know, in hospitals they have a blue code or they have different codes where everyone rushes in. They know they have to come. But in case you do not have it in-house, then you must have a, some kind of a button so that you can call your rescue to teams while you are doing the initial stabilization. They provide you help, support, both moral and technical, advice and guidance. The next step, so once you are proceeded with the resuscitation, initial resuscitation, and you've called for help. The next step is start thinking uh, as to what is the cause. Because systematic consideration of various causes of uh, uh, collapse can help you identify the cause and direct the management accordingly, and then initiate directed action. This is a very beautiful picture which I have uh, again picked up from Green Top Guidelines, which shows you the different causes of maternal collapse. So it could be intracranial hemorrhage secondary to uh, eclampsia, which will not come without warning signs. Then it could be anything related to heart. It could be aortic dissection, which again would be symptomatic. Patient would have chest pain, cardiac causes like arrhythmias, myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathy. It could be hypoglycemia in case your patient is diabetic. It could be any of the hemorrhagic causes which we are well versed with and we know how to uh, rule them out except for concealed hemorrhage is one which one needs to be careful about. It could be drugs, it could be over, -toxic over uh, dose, uh, toxicity of magnesium sulphate or a systemic injection of uh, local uh, that is xylocaine or uh, overdose of illicit drugs and of course pulmonary embolism and amniotic fluid are the ones which have to be suspected and ruled out. Well, that is the guy, we direct our management depending on the cause, but two very important things which are the hallmarks of actually protecting you later on uh, from, uh, you know, medical legal litigations and even prevent medical legal litigations from happening is communication, good communication. Good communication within the team 
and with the attendance of the patient is extremely, extremely important. It is an important interface. There has to be one senior person who should be interacting and communicating and telling them what is happening. Documentation, whether the results are good, outcome is good or bad, documentation is most, most important. So the team has, there has to be a mock drill kind of a thing in the nursing homes so that we know who is going to do what. So that is what is important. Well, debriefing, this is the hallmark of holistic maternity approach. Uh, this is something uh, we would not do. We go into a blame game. You, me, that, who. So the energy should not be wasted there. Let's understand, people do not learn from experience. They learn from reflecting on their experiences. So we should give time to reflect upon our experiences. Everyone should sit together and a debriefing session should be done. It is not to kind of blame. No one would do these things intentionally. It has got missed out. So we need to look at the gaps and try and plug them. So that is very, very important. And it is not only briefing of the debriefing of the team, it is debriefing of the patient if she recovers and also of the attendants. So lesson learned is no procedure in obstetrics is without risk. Why obstetrics? Nothing is without risk. You go to the road, someone might hit you. So it is Anyone can get caught anywhere, anytime. What is the way forward? The way forward is preparedness. So we should have the requisite knowledge, we should impart and uh, you know, spread the requisite knowledge and understanding of the causes of maternal collapse. We should ensure availability of emergency equipment, drugs, etc. in the form of pre-prepared kits, so that in case a patient is collapsed, a kit comes. Not that you are looking, hunting for drugs. Availability of trained personnel in the house, and otherwise a backup, which is pre-identified, both obstetric and uh, uh, medical rescue team should be there and society should really come forward and float this idea. And I'm sure everyone would kind of get on board and would want this kind of help. Local protocols should be in place. Process of transferring the patient in case the facilities are not available, a well-equipped ambulance should be there. How and where, depending upon, especially in the private setups, if uh, the patient is poor or patient is rich, where and whom you should have a license and should send such a patient. Well, safe motherhood, uh, a safe, healthy mother and a healthy baby is the dream of all obstetricians, whichever part of the world we are in. But anyone can come across these kind of events and these should not dissuade our youngsters from opting for obstetrics. And we should rather, uh, you know, generate confidence in them by improving their preparedness. Well, this is uh, a picture which I thought I would share with all of you uh, today. This is when I joined my journey uh, in Lady Harding Medical College as an assistant professor. So with Dr. Maya Sood as the head of the department. So uh, th this was the team there. Dr. Baliga and Dr. Sanjeevni are missing from this picture. And I do not have words to actually uh, convey my thanks to my seniors who have been a part of this beautiful journey. If I look back, I look back with lots of satisfaction. Thank you so much, my teachers and my mentors. Thank you so much. A big round of applause for Dr. Manju Puri. from Saheli Act and to give vote of thanks, I would request Mr. Barun Das, who is an IIT IIM and London School of Economics alumni. He is 
ex CEO of Z News, youngest CEO of news industry with exceptional track record. Now he is the co-founder of Saheli app and we are committed to make Saheli app a global innovation under his guidance. I would request him to please come on stage and give vote of thanks. Please put your hands together for Mr. Bhagat. Uh, good afternoon and uh, as always I feel extremely belittled to be with so many doctors and at the risk of sounding repetitive I say that we always believe we ordinary human being that the doctors are somewhere in between us and the God and possibly closer to the letter so thank you very much for associating us in this endeavor and uh, Dr. Sharda Jain, I think any one of us would say anything that will not sort of be sufficient uh, to speak about our leadership, vitality, energy level. I mean, it's contagious also and everybody from DGF, I see that they've come to that level in their, in their sense of belonging and their energy level. Dr. Dr. Madhu Goel, Dr. Uh, Ila Gupta and all the doctors who are here. Uh, just one uh, commitment that I want to make with permission from Dr. Sharda Jain that uh, this was done by doctors with such short notice and had been done in such an organized manner it impressed me and I think we should strive and we should try and see that we make it much bigger next year and if you are uh, allowed to be part of it even the next year I think we should be able to do a, a far greater and grandier show next year and thank you very much uh, Sure. Thank you very much once again and thanks for being uh, making us part of it. A tribute to our motherland, Bande Matara. Thank <laughs> you. 